In this week's episode of Studio Inter, we'll be discussing the fallout from the Derby de la Madonina. We'll be previewing the Champions League game against Borussia Mönchengladbach with Bundesliga commentator Kevin Hatchard. We'll be previewing the game against Genoa, this week's Moji, Moratti and Frog, and much, much more. Everything here on Studio Inter, only on sempreinter.com. Benvenuti, bentornati to another edition of Studio Inter. Uh, my name is Nima Tali Ruzzari, who is uh, not quite recovered yet from that derby, uh, that unnecessary derby defeat. Um, and we don't really have that much time to dwell on that uh, because we have bigger and bigger, we have really, we have some important things ahead of us, not bigger and better things, hopefully better, but definitely not bigger. Um, uh, but before before we get to all of that, uh, let me introduce my panelists. Uh, he is the Semprinter.com preview writer, Mr. Mohamed Nasa. Yeah, recharged, full tank of positivity, ready to go. Hi, everyone. Yes, we're going to need it. <laughs> um, and we're also joined by our good friend, Mr. William Beckman. Good evening. Remember, Mo's Marathi last week was the derby. So looking forward to uh, <laughs> finding out how, how that went. <laughs> Yeah, well, we know what the mod is going to be. We said it, you said it, you called it last week. Call it over Zlatan. Um, so, and we're also joined by, for the first time this uh, this season, our very good friend from Milan. Uh, he's uh, He works for Inter Supporters, uh, where he does an excellent job, Mr. Fulvio Santucci. Hi, Nima. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here to announce another year of Crazy Inter. Mm, exactly. I knew you were. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Um, and we have a very special guest. Uh, he he also he he's a he's a TV commentator for Bundesliga's English World Feed. He works for UEFA.com, Talksport, Amazon, and Betfair as a presenter and as an expert. Uh, he, he he making his studio inter debut. Welcome, Mr. Kevin Hatchett. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. It's a great pleasure to have you. Um, the reason I wanted to ask you one is because I, I, most of our listeners, myself included, we do we, if we watch the Bundesliga, we might watch Borussia Dortmund or even uh, Bayern Munich, even. Um, and Not might. Uh, no. You're missing out. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And and we're also missing out. Uh, well, well I, I've tried to watch the, because I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to combat middle age by being a hipster. And the, the number one hipster in world football right now is Marco Rose. And he's, he's you know, he's the choice of all the hipsters. Uh, and, and he's the coach of Borussia Mönchengladbach, who Inter are going to play in the Champions League this Wednesday. So I wanted to invite you on uh, to ask, I mean, obviously Inter have loaned out Valentino Lazaro, to Gladbach, not that Gladbach would notice, given that he was injured before he barely get off, got off the, the plane. Um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about Marco Rose, because he is a little bit of a, like the hipster's choice for the next German super coach. Um, what would you, how would you, what would you say characterizes his style uh, in terms of attack and, and defense? Well, I think you have to look at the track record first. So you look at when he was at Salzburg and coach there. Uh, he actually won the UEFA Youth League, which is a very prestigious competition uh, with Salzburg's youngsters. And they played terrific football. He got promoted uh, from within to the top job alongside Rene Maric, who's a very important tactical mind alongside him. And they took Salzburg uh, deep into the Europa League, uh, won the domestic title, as you would expect, of course, in Austria. And so he really earned that move to Borussia Mönchengladbach. And there were a lot of clubs that wanted him. Wolfsburg were very strongly linked with him. Schalke looked at him. Hoffenheim, we thought for a long time he was going to be the replacement for Julian Nagelsmann, but it didn't work out that way. And so uh, he was somebody who clubs wanted to bring in. Why is that? Well, with the ball, a lot of really interesting combinations. They like to get the ball uh, forward as quickly as possible. Very fluid system in attack. You've got guys like Alassane Player, Marcus Turam, 
uh, Lars Stindl who move around. They will circulate. Jonas Hoffman is another one. So there isn't necessarily a focal point in that attack, but they were all circulate and combine very nicely indeed. And without the ball, they work ever so hard. So very, uh, you know, well drilled in terms of pressing and counter pressing. And what they want to do with the pressing is force teams wide and then kind of trap them in those areas. But Whereas it worked very, very well last season, they've just hit a bit of a sticky patch at the start of this campaign. Well, don't worry. They're going to play Antonio Conte, who who boosts their confidence for sure. <laughs> um, I'll hand you over. I, I know Mo's got a question for you. Mo? Yeah, I uh, wanted to ask you a quick question about uh, about the, the sticky patch that they've, that they've had so far this season. It seems like uh, last year uh, they were quite uh, defensively uh, solid, uh, mentioning Gladbach. But uh, it, w- what seems to be the problem this year? That I think they've let in already uh, five goals or something, which was uh, which is quite uh, quite higher than their average uh, per game last season. Is there is there a particular reason uh, to their uh, defensive lack uh, defensive issues at the back? Well, it doesn't help when you have Borussia Dortmund away first up. So that's never great <laughs> when you're running into Holland, uh, Gio Reyna, uh, Jude Bellingham, Jaden Sancho. So you know. Th- that was always going to be a tough game for them. I think 3-0 was probably a bit harsh. I think they played better than that. Certainly Marco Rosa felt that they played better than that. But I think more concerning is actually the performances at home. Because if you look at the first home game against Union Berlin, who were a good side, but not a great side, they had the advantage, but then conceded a very late goal um, from a, a simple header from a cross. And Marco Rosa admitted afterwards that, you know, they probably didn't do enough to win the game. And you look at the weekend's match at home to Wolfsburg, very similar story, took the lead in the 78th minute from the penalty spot and then gave away a rather careless goal to Wout Weghorst. But actually, Wolfsburg did have plenty of chances in that second half. And again, Rosa is very honest, said, look, we, we didn't do enough to win the game. So... I think there have been issues with fitness to an extent. Alassane Player and Marcus Turam, who was so important for them, uh, weren't fit to start the season, weren't fully fit. Uh, and you look at the fact that Player was missing from that game. He'll be back uh, for the game against Inter, uh, but uh, he's just become a father. So he was absent for that reason at the weekend. And it's just all the pieces aren't quite fitting together at the moment. They're still a very good side, but things aren't sparking in the way that they did last season. And I just wonder whether that squad is going to be really stretched by Europe again. Mm. Uh, Fulvio, uh, did you have a question for Kevin? Uh, Yes, I have a question. Um, So, Kevin, um, I know that um, Borussia Mönchengladbach is playing very, very fast and very hard on the sides. And this is where Inter this year is struggling uh, a bit in defending. So my question is, uh, do you think that uh, uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach will come to San Siro uh, to attack this, uh, uh, this liability, this, uh, this uh, weak point uh, of, uh, of Inter? Or uh, uh, do you think uh, that uh, they are going to be a little more cautious uh, on, uh, on this game? And uh, second quick question, uh, is Liner fit for this game? Because I know that uh, went out injured in the last game. Uh, to answer the second one first, they hope so, uh, but not 100% at, on that at this stage. To answer the first question, I think they will play front foot because that's the only way they know how to play. They're not really the type of team that can go somewhere, dig in and make life tough for the opposition. They like to try and impose themselves. They like to play their game. And as you quite rightly mentioned, Wide overloads are a big part of that. So the fullbacks are are key. Guys like Liner, Oscar Vence or Ben Sabaini on the other side. They like to try and get forwards from fullback and then combine and create those wide overloads. And so they'll look to give, uh, especially I think Hakimi on that that right-hand side because they'll know Hakimi well. I love Ashraf Hakimi. I think he's a great player, but we know as devastating as he is going forward, he has issues defensively. We know this. And I think that's something that they will try and exploit. Um, Will, did you have a question for Kevin? Yeah, I did. Thanks for all that insight, Kevin. That was um, fascinating. Someone who doesn't uh, know, know a lot of, at all about uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach. Um, 
I just had a general question, really. So given that a lot of specifics have already been discussed about this match, you know, in terms of this draw, what was the reaction in Germany? Because I think Inter fans were, on the one hand, relieved that they, they'd avoided the kind of uh, disaster scenario of the last couple of years when they'd had groups of death. But at the same time, you know, this is a pot four side that I think a lot of teams would have preferred to avoid. So, you know, is there optimism in Germany that actually they could potentially get out of the group or is it seen as a bit of a mission impossible, this group for Gladbach? I think there's a realism. I think they're delighted to be in the tournament for a start because that was the aim at the start of last season. But of course, it was Marco Rose's first campaign. So they weren't sure if they were going to make it. It went right down to the wire. It was between them and their Rhineland rivals, Speyer Leverkusen. I think Leverkusen should have got there, but they rather blew it in the closing weeks of the season. And Gladbach were able to sneak in there. I think they were disappointed with their showing in the Europa League last season. And it is a a young group that's learning all the time. They haven't been together very long as a unit. So I think they know how tough it's going to be. I think it is a group of death, personally. I think it's, you know, if you've got Real, Shakhtar, who I know in to wipe the floor with Shakhtar in the Europa League, of course. uh, But we know they've got some dangerous players. And Gladbach, you know, there's no obvious weak side in that group there's no team where you think okay they're going to be the ones that get absolutely hammered in all six match days so it's a really intriguing group I think if they were to qualify for the last 16 it would be seen as a as a shock and a massive success for them because Dennis Sicari has been out so that that's a real blow for them and there are concerns about just how deep this Gladbach squad is. So I think they're excited, but I think they're realistic. Um, how do you think uh, this game is going to go against Inter? Because Inter are in a, a very difficult period and have been leaking goals um, and and also are under a bit of a pressure coming from a derby defeat. Um, so how do you think this is going to go? And, 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 my, and do you think that Gladbach will go through it? And who do you think will join them if you do? I think Inter will win it. I do, I think, and I think Inter and Real will go through. Uh, I think it will go to form, if you like. Uh, I know you guys, by nature, are going to be more (laughs) sceptical about what Inter can do and what Antonio Conte can do. But from an outsider looking in, I've actually been quite impressed with a lot of what they've done. Uh, I'm a huge, huge uh, fan of Romelu Lukaku. I think he's a sensational striker. I think the numbers he has put up uh, are worthy of massive respect. I love the combinations between him and Lautaro. Uh, I think there's a lot to be excited about. But the interesting thing is, and I don't know if you guys agree with me here, Conte now can't complain about not being backed because mm. the money they've spent on wages, on transfers, and bringing in the kind of players that he would want to work with, you know, they've brought in veterans like Vidal, like Kolarov, but they've made some other interesting signings as well, like Hakimi. So I look at that squad, and obviously it's stretched at the moment by COVID-19 and what have you, like a lot of clubs are. But I look at that squad and think, okay, this is it now. You have to work with this squad, and it's very, very strong. So I think Inter can make a real splash this season. Well, I hope you're right. Um, I, I, I wish I shared your optimism, but <laughs> <laughs> I thought you I might have my not. doubts. Hello. I have my doubts. <laughs> may, so. may, 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 I share, may I share a quick, a quick thing with, uh, with Kevin about, go about the game? Or is, go, is it go late? For it, go for it, go for it, go for it. Uh, yeah, Kevin, I'm, uh, as, a, as an Inter fan, I'm a little bit worried about uh, the mismatch uh, that could create uh, between uh, Marcus Turam and uh, Danilo D'Ambrosio. I don't know if you have a chance to watched the derby of Milan on Saturday, but if you did, uh, you surely noticed that uh, uh, D'Ambrosio against Rafa Leao was a clear witness match uh, for all the game. And uh, I mean, uh, they're not the same kind of player, but uh, Turam and Leao share some skills, uh, uh, the speed. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, this could be the key for Mesh um, Gladbach to try to get at least a point uh, in Milan? Potentially. And I think what's really interesting is 
they have that fluidity. So sometimes you'll see Turam operate down the left. Sometimes you'll see him operate down the right. So if he is having joy against D'Ambrosio, they might stick with that. If it's not quite working and they fancy having a go at Hakimi on the other side, it's not unusual for them to switch wings. One of the keys you'll see in this front four, even with player as the kind of furthest guy forward, if player starts the game, he will drift and, and they'll combine and, you know, Embolo they can bring on for, you know, a bit more power maybe. So they do have lots of options and if Marco Rosa, as you do, feels there is a potential mismatch there with D'Ambrosio, then that would not surprise me to see him test D'Ambrosio with Duram in the opening exchanges. But as I say, if that's not working out, don't be surprised if they switch around. Thank you so much, Kevin. If people want to follow you on Twitter and uh, if you've got something coming up that you want to plug, then go right. Then, then the floor is yours. Uh, on Twitter at Kevin Hatchard, very imaginative, yes. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm on on games all the time. So I'm on uh, Champions League for UEFA Match Day Live. So that's a lot of fun. So make sure you join us through uh, uh, the Champions League app or UEFA.com. Thank you very much, Kevin. We appreciate you coming on. Cheers, guys. Take care. Right. Uh, well, um, that uh, let's we'll we'll quickly have a look of the uh, of, of that game itself. I think I think that a lot of this game uh, is going to be for me. The way I look at this game is the same way I looked at Slavia Prague last season. Um, and it's if Inter lose this game, then the chances of going through are are over. Uh, the way I see it, um, I don't see the, the, it's it really is make or break immediately uh, because it is a very evenly balanced group because Real Madrid are not what they used to be. We don't really know where we have Mönchengladbach. Gladbach. We know where we don't really know where we have Inter and Shakhtar, even though Inter mopped the floor with them in the Europa League. Um, I think it's a different Shakhtar we're playing because it's also home and away and it's a different Inter. It's not the Inter that, that we saw back then that is going to going into to, to these games now. So for me, it's a little bit, I'm I'm nervous going into this, uh, especially after what we saw in the derby uh, this weekend. But I but I think Inter will get a draw. I'm thinking two two draw. Um, what about you, Mo? What do you think? No, I really I, I honestly think uh, we're gonna win. I think we're gonna win. Uh, it'll be uh, it'll be you know we'll, again it won't be the clean sheet we're all dreaming of yet. But I think uh, overall. Uh, uh, like Kevin was saying, it's a young team. It's inexperienced. Our team, our guys uh, are are older, more mature. Uh, I think the experience of uh, the Europa League last year has been probably uh, very, uh, you know, very important and critical to the team's overall character and development. I think uh, managing games like these are 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 going to be much more uh, efficiently dealt with. So I reckon it's a uh, it's a straightforward win without a clean sheet. So maybe three or two one. Uh, for Inter. Fulvio, where are you, what do you think is going to happen if you talk uh, if you were to predict a, a result and a kind of game uh, going into this? Uh, well, it's uh, it's very difficult to say because uh, it really depends uh, by the players that uh, Antonio Conte is uh, uh, is able to to line. Um, I know that Bastoni is in once again. I don't know anything about Young at the moment, uh, and uh, it's uh, something that matters at the end of the day. Um, so I hope for a win because uh, if Inter doesn't win, uh, could be uh, psychologically devastating uh, after the after the derby. For sure. Um, what do you think? Do you do you dare to make a prediction, or are you too scared? <laughs> Uh, well, I know I know very well uh, Inter. I know fairly well Borussia Mönchengladbach. I think we can win this game. Uh, especially if uh, we are able to score in the last, in the, sorry, in the first uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so I would say 3-1. Uh, Will, where are you uh, on this game? Do you think we're going to win or do you think it's going to be a draw? Or, or how, what are your thoughts going into this? Uh, I think it's a very dangerous game. I, I think the draw is the option that's uh, seeming most plausible to me at the moment. I certainly can't see a clean sheet um, given the evidence of the last few matches and what Kevin has told us about the about all that um, strength they've got in wide areas. So, yeah, I think this is, um, it's dodgy. I, I, I agree with you that this is already huge. I don't think it's over if we lose, because as you said, this is, a, this is an even group. We could lose home to Gladbach and, and win at the, um, well, we're not going to win at the Bernabeu, because it's not being played there. But, you know, we could beat Real Madrid. Um, so it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a tight one. But yeah, certainly if you don't win this match, then 
Uh, certainly if you lose it, then um, you are in a huge spot of bother, um, leaving aside the sort of psychological scars that could be left after the um, after the derby. See, I think maybe a draw. Um, as for Ashley Young, I read today from Gianluca Di Marzio that he cannot play in this match uh, because uh, Skriniar and Young need to test negative within a bit, uh, more than 24 hours before the start of the match. And Young doesn't finish his quarantine until Tuesday. So I don't think there's actually the, the sort of technical time to actually get him back into the squad. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm nervous, as you said, because this is, uh, this is, this is a game that on paper is a game that Inter have to win because they're at home to the team in pot four. So it is very similar yeah. to that W Prague match last year. Um, you know, I would have ideally maybe preferred maybe an away match, you know, a game where, you know, a win is a bonus and uh, rather than sort of immediately being under pressure to put points on the board. But you know, ultimately, we, we, won't, we won't fail to get out of this group because of the calendar. So uh, we've got to get on with it. Um, but so, I think so what's your prediction for a result if you were to... Give one one one. Mm. Okay. Well, the thing is, I I think this is um for like this kind of ties in what Kevin said and and what you kind of said and what you've all kind of said is this ties again really into the Darby defeat because we know with Alexander Kolarov playing there that this was going to end badly and it did uh and it really really exposed Inter for for all the weaknesses they have and now they're playing against a team that that is younger and faster now obviously Alexander Kolarov won't play one can hope even though Antonio Conte adamantly uh, said post-match that Alexander Kolarov is absolutely a central defender and that is his correct position, even though it was obvious for everyone with a pair of functioning eyeballs that it, that's not that's just not the case. Um, but regardless, this is... Um, the, the, the derby, the thing that got me the most is, is again, the issue of balance, the issue of squad depth in defensively, which Inter don't. Somehow... Inter and Antonio Conte have managed to weaken the best defense statistically in the Serie A last season by sending, you know, by essentially Antonio Conte chasing Diego Godin off the Italian mainland to Sardinia and replacing him with uh, Alexander Kolarov. And and that is a problem. Uh, and that's going to be a problem this season. And if it's not fixed in, especially when you consider that Ivan Perisic is the starting left wing back right now in a position that he's not comfortable with which means that Inter's entire left wing is a giant gaping hole of problems and errors which Milan and Zlatan Ibrahimovic quite brilliantly exposed and not to mention that Danilo D'Ambrosio as Fulvio said earlier was 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 completely out of it and 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 was wrecked for pace with Rafael Leao so I I think this the derby win for me look it, losing the derby is never fun it's never nice but it's not the end of the world, not losing the derby, especially when you think that it was four years ago that Milan won the derby. But for me, the, the, I see broader issues here, and I want to talk to you guys about it um, later on. But first, I want to hear what you thought about the game, Fulvio. Because going into this game, my thoughts were, I hope Ibrahimovic doesn't score a poker, a four goals on Inter. So 2-1 was kind of better than what I thought. I thought 4-1 for Milan. But what, what were you expecting and what were you, what did you think was going to happen? And, and what are your thoughts on what actually did happen? Uh, well, you know, Nima de Derby is always unpredictable, uh, especially because uh, normally when you are uh, the underdog, uh, you're going to win. And uh, at some point, Inter could be considered the underdog because of the, of the missing players that, uh, that they have due to, due to the COVID issue. Um, so I did not expect anything from this game, and I did not make any uh, any prediction, um, to be honest. Um, and uh, I I have to say that uh, the beginning was not so was not so bad. I think that uh, that uh, episode uh, for on the phone where Kolarov of fold uh, so bad Ibrahimovic uh, basically was a turning point into the game. Um, but uh, I think that uh, despite uh, everything, uh, Inter could have been able to enter again into the game, uh, in this, especially in the second half. Um, our guys, our lads, made made a lot of confusion, to be honest. Right? Um, too much, uh, too much panic, uh, too much confusion. Um, I remember just D'Ambrosio, uh, which have a tough game, I understand, but it basically means two or three passes, 10 meters uh, to Akimi. Mm. Uh, then something, something else when you, uh, when, when, when the players uh, take, took out the ball uh, 
from our area. We lost a lot of Poles, everyone, Eriksen, Varela, Brozovic, everyone. Um, so this, despite everything, we could have uh, managed to, uh, to come back into the game and um, probably get a point, at least a point on that. But uh, uh, speaking now, uh, at the light of what happened, and uh, 48 hours later, I think that uh, at the end of the day, is not so, this match is not so different uh, uh, from the one against Fiorentina. Uh, what, is, what differs uh, was the, the lack of alternatives, while against Fiorentina, Conte could, could make like uh, five substitutions, and here were two, and uh, of course the result. Um, but uh, same problems, uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is a proof uh, that uh, uh, with these players, uh, Inter cannot play with uh, two wing and two strikers. It's too much, and the midfield is not able to, to take the balance on that. I think that's pretty clear right now. Uh, it's, it's easy to blame the defenders, and uh, they have something to be blamed for, uh, especially Kolarov. But it's always difficult when you, when you defend, and you need to defend like 60, 70 meters on the pitch um, uh, behind you. Uh, that means that practically it's, it's a continuous apnea. Uh, you struggle in every, in every second of the game. You cannot play calm, you cannot play focused because of this. Um, so I think that uh, oh, Conte needs to make some adjustments as soon as possible about that. Because uh, I think he cannot propose, he, he can no longer propose this kind of, uh, this kind of unbalanced team. Mm. Will? Yeah. Uh, amen to all of that. I, I, when I was watching the Fiorentina game, I was praying that I never had to watch Kolarov and Perisic on the left wing again in the same team again. And lo and behold, it's happened again in the derby um, with predictable results. I thought that hole, as you said, there was a gaping hole <laughs> on that side of the pitch. And uh, again, you know, the, the, the foul itself was poor for the, the penalty, but Brozovic and Perisic's complete inability to stop the counter-attack coming towards Inter's uh, defence was also fairly embarrassing. Um, we haven't mentioned Brozovic yet, so I'll, I'll throw in a mention for his sort of two out of ten performance. Um, it was, yeah, I, I, you know, Milan didn't create that much after they, they'd scored their two goals. So I think we could have got a point, but I, I agree that this is, you know, it's the same problem. We would have been papering over cracks again, I think. Um, I've just looked at the... Um, the, our, our results from the end of last season. It's, it's easy to forget that we finished last season with seven clean sheets from 10 games. Um, that feels like a, a pretty damn long time ago now. Um, obviously, you have the, the absentees to throw in. and That's, that's clearly a, a mitigating circumstance to some extent because of, if, uh, if Bastoni doesn't test positive, if Skriniar doesn't test positive, then obviously Kolarov doesn't start uh, and maybe things go, things go in a slightly different direction. But, you know, ultimately we were praising the squad depth um, after them, well, at least I was on this podcast a couple of weeks ago after the, uh, the the Mercato finished. And clearly, if there's one area where we don't have it, it's uh, or at least we don't have it in a uh, in a reliable capacity, then that's in defence. Um, so, I, I, no, I, you know, if you, if you, the, losing the derby is never never nice. Um, but ultimately, the the bigger concern is uh, the fact that we've had four four league games now and. Uh, we're seeing sort of similar problems in terms of what well, balance, as you said. You know, the, I don't think uh, I don't think that midfield uh, and that, as I said, that midfield is not brilliant enough to compensate for all of the the holes that are created sort of around it. Um, you know, if you had a a Kante, for instance, as Conte was looking for in the summer, then that would be that would be different. You'd probably be able to get away with a bit more. Uh, on the wings and in defence, but we don't have that kind of player, especially not if Brozovic is is uh, is in that kind of form that we saw on Saturday, because that's probably our, be- our cl- the closest thing we've got to someone who runs around the pitch and, and covers holes when he's on form, but he's clearly not at the moment. So yeah, it's it's just a it's a continued work in progress, and we haven't got much time to work on this team on the training ground because we've now got what seven games in three weeks or something. So mm. you know. Hopefully these these injured players can get back. Um, hopefully Conte can uh, stop playing Kolov and Perisic together. And hopefully this isn't um, this team is strong enough psychologically not to to buckle after losing the derby. You know we haven't lost a derby for a long time, so it's not a it's not something we know in terms of this group of players in terms of how they respond. 
Um, but yeah, Milan, fair enough. They, I think they probably they didn't um, they didn't steal anything, as the Italians always say mm. in that match. But uh, yeah, concerning that uh, this team to me seems like a, a jigsaw that hasn't been put together yet, and I'm worried that there isn't going to be much time for Conte to sit behind his desk and work it out. Mm. But I wanted to, I want to hear what you say, uh, Mo, about the game, and then I want to have a broader discussion about. The problem is that I see it because I do see problems. I, I, I see the wheels coming off here. I see the beginnings of the wheels coming off the Conte project. Uh, and, and I'm going to I want to I want us to discuss that a little bit later. But first, I want to I want to let you have some shared some positivity on this game. I double dare you, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, honestly, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll double down on what Fulvio said. This was the Fiorentina game 2.0. I mean, look, it's very difficult to judge. We, we've all spoken about balance. It's like the same way I can remember what what the, the hot uh, hot word was last season. But this season's word seems to be balance, at least the beginning of the season. And um, it's quite clear, uh, like Will noted, that uh, with Perisic and Hakimi on the side, and this midfield module just does not have the physical output to be able to compensate for those defensively lapsing wings. Now you combine Kolarov with that, and then it's a problem. Now, look, first thing first, I'll, I'll say that, you know, clearly Kolarov was at fault in the first goal. Maybe he was, you know, uh, not marking uh, Ibrahimovic as closely as he should have in the second goal. But I think, um, and again, to Will's point, I think the losers of the match uh, have to be uh, and Ambrosio, and I'm the biggest uh, D'Ambrosio fan uh, over the years, but he, he had an abysmal game, and Brozovic. I think Brozovic's uh, inability, unwillingness, inattentiveness, whatever, whatever, whatever adverb you want to put, put there, uh, to, to do the work, to be able to give that fragile back three the, the, the security that they need to be able to get on with their business has been, uh, you know, has probably been the, the main reason why Inter looked so weak in the final third. Vidal was Vidal. He was reckless. He was uh, uh, running around a bit like a headless chicken. But, but you always look to, to Brozovic to be able to give some, you know, solidity. So I think it's unfair to judge the Conte project on this particular game in light of the absences. I mean, you know, um, there I say, had uh, Gagliardini been uh, on for Brozovic, maybe the side would have had more balance. Had uh, anyone, you know, just keep take one of those of of those four players or five critical positions, and replace them with the preferred starter, and I would imagine that the side would have been far more balanced. And like Fulvio said, despite all of that, I reckon this was our game to lose at the end. Um, it, 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 by far the most dangerous chances, by far the the most uh, egregious errors by the referee came against Inter. The chances were missed by us. So uh, on another night, uh, this 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 match should have ended in a draw and could have easily ended in an Inter win. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm for me it's not too much drama. It's it really isn't too much drama, and I don't I don't. It doesn't feel like it is. It doesn't feel like, like uh, uh, Will spoke about uh, the team being able to take the psychological impact of a derby loss. And it doesn't feel like this, you know, it seems like the, the, it's already been brushed off. They're looking forward to the München Gladbach game, uh, the positivity in, in, in getting back Nangolan and, uh, and Bastoni is already, uh, you know, some welcome news. So, I, I, and of course, Sensi is back as well. So it's, I, I think, I think um, I, I like the, I like this um, analogy of a of a jigsaw puzzle, and I think uh, the solution is there. The fact like, I like the fact that it's I like that analogy because it it means that there is a solution, you know, because a jigsaw pl- a puzzle by definition, unless there's a yeah. piece missing, you know, uh, by default there is there is a solution, and I I imagine that that the solution is in front of Conte, and it's just been a series of unfortunate incidents. And circumstances that have led us to this point, but I'm um, I'm I'm all in, man. I'm gonna for me. Yeah, I think I think so. I, yeah. sorry, sorry, Neem, I fucking I, I agree I agree with that. Um, I just would like to add to, to my to my previous analysis that actually uh, the solution is not it's not so uh, it's not so complex to find, right? Because you have a long roster and you can find you can find alternatives. Uh, but I think the funny part of this is that uh, it's like Conte is uh, believing uh, that the season is playing uh, with uh, N'Golo Kante on the on the midfield because basically this is exactly the the style of play which requires uh, a defensive midfielder uh, of, of 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 a top level 
which is probably in Golo Kante, but Inter <laughs> does not have it. Someone needs to inform Conte about this. Well, for me, look, it's not a derby loss. As, as, as we've all said, it's not fun and nice to lose the derby. And I'm not even going to talk about the fact that I feel this was incredibly unnecessary, uh, that this, this, this was entirely avoidable, and that Inter were a little bit lucky against Fiorentina, and that kind of evens out throughout the season, and it kind of started evening out against Milan. It's not even about that. The way I look at it, and the reason why I'm very, very skeptical of this Conte project now, is because... He has is going through an identity crisis, the way I see it. His statements of saying that, which 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 are con- completely contradictory to everything this man has said and done up to this point in his career, which has been defensive solidity and hard work, but also attacking attacking aggress- aggr- aggressiveness and aggr- and an aggressive attack. Now he's talking about well, it doesn't really matter if you concede two three goals. What matters is that you score four or five. When did Inter turn into some sort of expensive Atalanta? And when and why are Inter paying for Antonio Conte to become an imitation of Giampiero Gasperini or may dare your God forbid, Zdenek Zeman? Because that's essentially what we're watching here. There is no balance. Uh, exactly, but literally, <laughs> the that, things he's been saying. Are yeah, I know. What really the hell is going on? And the only solution yeah. and conclusion I come to this when I listen to this nonsense is that, well, you decided to get rid of Diego Godin because you wanted Arturo Vidal for, at every price, and you decided to 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 replace him with Alexander Kolarov. Now you're doubling down that he's a central defender, even though he isn't. And when he plays so for Serbia, Serbia are balanced in a different way, so that so his his deficiencies aren't exposed as as ruthlessly as they are at Inter. You have Ivan Perisic, who you yourself said a year ago that he can't give me what I want. He doesn't know how to play as a second striker or as a winger. Was sent to Bayern Munich, where he plays as a winger, won everything, came back, is a year older, and now all of a sudden he's the answer to our wing-back problems? Look, th- this is this is th- there's too much here t- that doesn't add up, and Antonio Conte isn't stupid. He knows what he's doing. The way I see it, the way I interpret it, this is an audition for the PSG job, where he wants to redefine himself as the free-flowing, happy 5-4-7-2 winning Antonio Conte, and Inter are paying the price for it. There is no way, no how, that Inter are winning the Serie A playing like this. It is abundantly clear for anyone with a pair of functioning eyeballs that when you have, any, when you, like Fulvio said, when you have 60, 70 meters of pitch conceded to someone, to, to, to teams to attack, it doesn't matter if it's Bastoni or Kolarov playing. You're going to lose. It's just not going to work. Then it's only accentuated and made far, far worse by the fact that it's Alexander Kolarov and Ivan Perisic who don't know what the hell they're doing. And you don't have a midfielder like like Fulvio said, like N'Golo Kante, who can make up for it because he covers each pitch space. To me, this is this is madness. What we're what we're witnessing here is is some weird experiment where this guy is basically auditioning for his next job uh, and, and trying to redefine himself and Inter are paying for it and will be left with a bunch of 30 plus year olds that no one wants with high wages, which will struggle to offload again next summer. It's like a perpetual, like, like, a, like a cycle that just perpetuates itself. And this really, 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 really frustrates the crap out of me. Um, may, may I add? Go, may go, 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 Fulvio, yeah. go. Sorry, Fulvio, Fulvio, then Mo. Yeah, yeah, I, I, would, be, I would be very quick, Mo, sorry. <clears throat> just let me add an element to, to, your, to, your, to your brilliant equation. Uh, and we need to consider here, and we need to consider that this is a special season and uh, special because uh, it's not like the other, uh, the previous one. And uh, we need to remember that Inter started the season one month ago, uh, from practically, practically from scratch, uh, started the season one month ago. Uh, so there was no time to, to make anything um, before in, in, in the preseason. So um, this this uh, this could be a perspective because uh, uh, practically Conte has the same team of last year, um, at least the same uh, uh, how can I say the same spine of the last mm. year mm. plus Vidal, and uh, he knows uh, that uh, he cannot play exactly like the last year because it's not enough, right? So what I'm proposing now is that uh, Conte is uh, thinking to do something different. But uh, uh, needs to have uh, some time to to implement that because uh, this style of play is interesting, especially in this 
Serie A in this uh, weird Serie A in which teams really scores a lot, uh, incredibly lot, incredibly higher amount of goals uh, uh, if you compare to the uh, to the usual or to the last year. Uh, and uh, I would I would like to say to you, Nima, that eventually it could work. And I think that the puzzle that we have here is uh, close to be completed uh, and uh, the pieces uh, are missing, uh, but they are important pieces, of course, but they are not so much. I think that all that Conte needs to understand is how he can balance this team on the midfield. And after that, I think he has the potential to win the league. Mark these words. Mm. Mo? Plus 1,000 million in agreement with Fulvione, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I was just going to say that. I think, uh, I think uh, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, and no one's a bigger conspiracy theorist than I am. Uh, uh, so I think uh, if, in fact, uh, Conte is playing 4D chess and, uh, and auditioning for, uh, for the PSG job, uh, then... I, I, that makes me even more confident because there's no chance in hell he's going to get the job if he doesn't win the, the Serie A with Inter. Uh, everyone, his his outburst and his uh, all-in, he's he's played his, his he's played his hand last season with that outburst, and everyone knows exactly what's up. So he knows he's all in. So I think if he's auditioning for something better, the only way he can back that up is by is with the Serie A title or the Champions League. Not the Coppa Italia for sure. So it's 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 this. So if he in fact is is playing that game, it makes me even more confident that uh, we're in for a good season. Man, how many times he have we to, were 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 we up uh, top top of the list? Uh, you know, uh, uh, the winter champions, the November uh, champions, whatever uh, champions, and then we eat shit at seventh place. You know, it's it's it, it, really it's we have the best <laughs> squad and we have possibly. Quite probably the, the the best manager in the city uh, and the strongest squad. So I'm I, I'm still super confident. Milan Milan like Milan yesterday. This was the best. They put out their best team. They played their best game. They can't do any better than this. And still they got they were quite lucky to get come away with the Please with the win. Please don't say lucky. So, Please don't say lucky. Please. No, don't I, think, say I think I think Please I think I think. They they were lucky that Inter were were not able to convert the chances that they saw that they normally would have converted quite easily. Uh, I mean that that Lukaku flick in the 92nd, 95th minute. Good God, if that back heel had gone in, if how, my how grandmother much, had testicles, uh, she'd be my grandfather. You know, Sorry, man. Like I, I love you, you know that, but please don't say lucky because that drives me insane. He's paid 12 million euros net per season, and he goes out and talks about luck. It's not luck that you sent Godin away to bring in Vidal and Kolarov. That's a decision. Luck has yeah, nothing course, to do with it. How many times did uh, Kolarov drive the ball all the way and, and overload the uh, and offensive? You know, uh, Kolarov is part, you know, we, we, we can't look at, at, we have to look at the full picture. So, of course, with Kolarov on the pitch as a central defender, and, you know, let's, let's, take, let's take this particular game, you know, cast it aside for a bit because, you know, of the unfortunate circumstances regarding player fitness that have surrounded the match. But it, as a whole, if you have Kolorov playing in a three-man defense, you're able to do things when you're in position offensively with Kolorov in terms of ball distribution in the in the opponent's half that you're completely unable to do with either Bastoni or Skriniar, or Godin for that matter. So it's not like... But you hemorrhage Kolarov goals. Is, I mean... No, <laughs> but, you know, again, you hemorrhage goals... Well, let's, let's forget, uh, forget this game, uh, but let's talk about balance uh, uh, to the side as a whole. Yeah, no. I was sure. I was sure that uh, the, are we getting the picture here? Because I I, see, I, I heard a lot of talking about uh, the swap for Godin and Kolarov, but uh, I keep wondering: is Godin able to uh, to cope with this situation? Because uh, he also had like 60 meters uh, behind him to cover. I mean, in this situation, in this very moment, uh, the defender of Inter should be Usain Bolt and Ben Johnson, right? <laughs> Best player, because there's no way, there's no way to do that. It's not a matter of who is doing what. I mean, Kolarov was a disaster, and not because of this, but because he fouled uh, in that way Zlatan Ibrahimovic, and we know that, all right? Probably, probably, um, probably Godin, Diego Godin uh, is not entitled to do something like that, and we, are, we all agree with that. But uh, in the style of play, I think that uh, it's not a matter of uh, swapping players because any players is struggling. 
you take Danilo D'Ambrosio, Danilo D'Ambrosio never struggled playing in the, in the three defense, never struggled. But struggles now because he had a lot of field to cover. And once again, it, it just takes the time to uh, understand what to do with the midfield and uh, how to balance this team. Uh, I think that uh, uh, at some point, uh, if you play with Hakimi in the, in the right side and Young in the left side, something is going to improve because Young is a more defensive player. So let's, let's, uh, let's give some time to this, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's not a matter of players. At, 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 uh, it's probably the first year in which I can say since 10 years, it's not a matter of players. I mean, Trust me, it's not yeah, a matter of players. I, 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 think, I think it's both a matter of wrong players in the wrong positions and also a matter of balance and and also stubbornness i think it's a combination of everything i mean when we'll use the example of of jigsaw puzzles yeah jigsaw and, and mo said you you know the definition of a jigsaw puzzle is is that you can solve it well that's that's that 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 that's built on the premise that the jigsaw puzzles are all from the same package i i'm worried that we've got seven eight jigsaw packages of puzzles all muddled together and we've got a crazy guy trying to put fit all the pieces into it and you know ever, you've ever seen a child who doesn't want to like like when they're playing and they're trying to shove Batting in that the corner pieces into the middle exactly <laughs> that, that's something his fist down on the on the table it won't go in <laughs> exactly thank you that's exactly what i meant will that's what i'm seeing here Sorry, I and i and i worry i'm worried i'm really worried Sorry, Will, go. I was just having a flashback to lockdown when I was doing a jigsaw puzzle of the London shoe map, and that was what I ended up <laughs> doing. <laughs> yeah. No, but seriously, come on. Like, what's your thoughts on this? Well, I, I, I agree that, that um, well, firstly, I, I don't think that all is lost in terms of the league campaign. You, know, you, you only need to look at this weekend's other results on the same day as Inter's defeat to Milan to find out that this is a league that, you know, the, the, our opponents are waiting for us. You know, Lazio lost 3-0, Atalanta conceded 4, Juventus didn't beat Crotone. So, you know, this, you, whoever wins the league this season is not going to have to be a perfectly old machine to do it. Now, that's not to say that Inter and their current guys can go 38 games playing like this with this starting eleven and win the league. I agree, there's, there's work to be done and there's not a huge amount of time on the training ground, as I said before, to do it. But I do believe that this is not the maximum potential of this team. One, for, for fitness, obviously, because, as we said, this is a strange season. Um, and two, because there are, you know, not everything has been not everything has been tried yet. Um, I, I hope I would expect that maybe by the next international break. So after this next cycle of six or seven games, we would have a much clearer idea of of what the best starting eleven is. Because at the moment, I think there's still a bit of confusion. Conte's not had everyone available necessarily at the same time to try everyone out, you know. I just remember that um, Stefano Sensi was also missing at the weekend. I'm sure he would have been useful um, in that midfield. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to push the panic button just yet. As far as um, as far as your your sort of theory about Conte sort of auditioning for PSG, I do I did I think this is probably the most interesting thing that I've found about the start of the season. This sort of radical change, not 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 only in you know what he's trying to do on the pitch by by pushing the team up higher, but but in terms of what he's saying in the media because yeah. we know that when they met in that um that wedding reception venue um a couple of months ago <laughs> one of the supposed sort of big um uh big problems to solve was the communication you know Inter didn't like that Conte was coming out and and criticizing the recruitment or criticizing the players and saying we don't have this we don't have that and that supposedly one of the the, reason, the ways that they were able to patch up their differences a couple of months ago was that they agreed on a sort of new communicative strategy. And you have you have very much seen a different Conte in, in his press conferences and his interviews so far. You know, the the I'd rather lose I'd rather win five four than draw nil nil. You know, that's the I kind mean, of thing that he would never have said last season. And I think he's he you can see the journalists kind of sniggering beneath their you know beneath their face masks when they're hearing these things because it's not it's not something you expect him to say. Um, so and and I wonder you know to what extent is this him trying to change himself, trying to evolve himself because he knows now that he's got this reputation and he knows one that it's not productive for into the season and also potentially for for future employees, you know, he needs to show that he's not, you know, is, is this, is this, is it, you know, does he, maybe this is the question, does he believe that this is genuinely the way to go this season or has he decided that, you know, this team is, is not balanced, but because he can't criticize them, he's going to sort of toe this line of saying, yeah, we have to attack. I don't know. It's, well, that's, it's, that's it's, exactly what I think it is. 
it's a very different it's a very different content i wonder how long it will last it's last but then because even on saturday he had a little bit of a dig he said you know we're playing with two wingers and, yeah and two forwards and then someone you know sort of sticks their nose up and says we need a trequartista as well you know so he's he's clearly not completely all in on this idea of, of filling the, the team with attacking players but he's he's trying to do it so that that's it's it's weird i don't know it's, this is a weird concept. it is weird and that's exactly <laughs> well, uh, it's on the, weird. On the perspective of the communication i think uh, i think this this could be um, a management project uh, if you if you want to if, if you ask me My, a management project which starts uh, during the, that meeting uh, in the in late august in which everybody decided to to go ahead with the project uh, and i think that uh, at that point uh, Conte has been uh, uh, has been asked, or just uh, uh, they put together some kind of action plan in order to make the communication of Conte different, right? Because uh, we can all agree that uh, it's not his style. We can all agree that uh, it's not this this kind of communication, but it's consistent and it's going on uh, since the very beginning of the season, the first uh, the first press conference uh, until the the declaration after the derby. So I think on the perspective of the communication uh, is the, is the management that uh, took some action on that and uh, uh, they decided to, to go to go with that. Uh, it's uh, it's unclear if Conte can resist like that without uh, without going uh, with, uh, with the full madness of his uh, declaration <laughs> to the press. But uh, I think that there's something that uh, is uh, is speaking to the to, to the very base of the management, right? It's something that is. Uh, uh, it's been decided uh, on the bottom line, uh, mm. to some extent. I mean, I, th- I, I, th- I think, because uh, I want to ask you, Fulvio, it's the first time you're on this season, how you think the season's going to end and all that. But I, I'm really, I think, I don't think there's a lot of room for, there's not any, there's not much room for a margin of error. There's not much room for error because the top four places in the Serie A is tightened a lot. The teams in, in the six, the top six, seven teams are much better than they were last season. And I think with this, exper- you know, Antonio Conte going, I don't know, experimental on everybody and is, 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 is just is going to create a situation where Inter will find themselves in fifth, sixth position in, in, in round 10, 11, trailing the fourth spot by five, six points, which is full crazy Inter. That's that that is crazy. Yeah. Inter. I mean, that's, that's what I'm worried about, you know. On the other, on the other end, you need to consider also that uh, this season has a very tight, very tight schedule. Just consider that uh, we are going, we and uh, and the uh, and the teams that are uh, with uh, in the European Cups will play like seven games in 20 days uh, in this uh, until the mid mid November, and after that, uh, it, there's another thing like that: seven games in, in 20 days, or in 15 or 18 days. Uh, um, from uh, the end of November until mid-December. Uh, so what does it matter at that, at that point, the depth of the team in terms of number and in terms of alternatives? Mm-hmm. And I think, sure. I think for the first year, Inter has the best team in that. Mm-hmm. I think that we have a little more, probably the same depth of Juventus, but uh, we are a little bit better in terms of uh, alternatives. I, I genuinely think this, and I think that uh, in December, mid-December, this uh, this is gonna this, this is gonna show uh, because uh, Atalanta is a good team. Uh, of course, it's a great team, uh, but uh, it's difficult to understand if they if they, they the starting eleven is or at least the alternative. The substitutes are going to play at the same level as starting eleven. Same for Lazio. Same for Napoli. Of course, and the same for Milan, Roma, and uh, and uh, all the teams involved in the European Cups. So I I would like to understand. I would like to wait and understand uh, if uh, if this depth that we have on the team is the first time that we have depth on the team. And Conte really, uh, I like this and say we need everybody. I count on everybody because everyone is gonna have some room at at some point uh, in this team. I think that this is gonna make a difference. Of course, if everybody are able to stay not injured, of course, because if mm. we end up like last year with Sensi out of uh, all of season, Barella injured for two months, uh, Sanchez injured for three months, uh, it's a different story, of course. But still, I think something like that. I want to ask you uh, b- uh, to do your prediction, like from places one to six in the Serie A. Just no, no, no need to uh, give any explanation. Just one to six, who's going to win? And- Mine. 
Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, so starting sixth place, Roma, fifth place, uh, Milan, fourth place, Atalanta, third place, Napoli, second place, Juventus, third place, Inter. Okay. Uh, Coppa Italia, who's going to win? Oh, it's difficult. I did not see the, the table yet. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see the table. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I go with Juventus. Uh, and do you think Napoli will win the Supercoppa or do you think Juve will win? Uh, I think I have a good chance, but it's probably they're probably gonna tie in the nine minutes, in the nine, nine, ninety minutes, and uh, probably it's gonna end up in the uh, standard time or uh, or penalties. But uh, be aware that uh, it's difficult to play the the Super Cup because it's difficult to find a day to play the Super Cup. So uh, it could, uh, at some point it could be weird. It could be it could be forgotten this uh, this competition. <laughs> Gravina special. Um, yeah. I was yeah. So, uh, what about Capocannoniere? Who do you think is going to win that? Uh, Romelu Lukaku. Mm, okay. Right. Uh, after, this weekend, Inter are playing a team that I have not, I really feel sorry for them. And the fact that they are forced to play with 13 COVID cases is ridiculous. Uh, I think Inter will destroy them. Um, and, and I hope that it doesn't become ugly. Because I think Genoa are, have been given such an unfair situation to cope with uh, after having 17 cases and only four players have recovered which means they have to play now um anything other than a 3-4-0 win for Inter is, is is to be considered a huge upset and that's where I think this is going to end so there's not really not much that much to say um what about you Mo just predictions on that yeah, uh, I, I predict a, a strong win. Maybe even that elusive uh, clean sheet. So let's say a 2-0. Um, I, I think we're going to take it easy. We, we just suffered uh, the, the wrath of the COVID. So maybe we'll, we'll be gentle with uh, the Grifoni. Mm. What about you, Fulvio? What do you think? I mean... Well, I always hope because uh, it depends a lot for, on the Champions League match especially psychologically, uh, but uh, I can figure a similar match of Benevento one. Mm. Uh, so a lot of goals scored, uh, probably someone considered something, con- some, see, yeah, yeah, some goal considered, like for one or for two. Mm. Uh, Will? Yeah, I think 3-1. Um, I think even if we lose that match on Wednesday, we should be good enough to beat General. But having said that, I've just checked and they're an hour into this match against Verona with loads of youngsters and they're still drawing nil-nil. So they must mm. they might have some good youngsters in their team, <laughs> uh, which is quite a heroic effort if they can hold out for us. Yeah, I mean, I, f- I feel so bad for them. Yeah, I, I really feel so. bad for them. It's... I- yeah, I don't, I don't see a non-victory in this match. I don't mm. think um, there's too much of a, of a danger there. Mm. No, and, and, and anything other than a clear win will just <laughs> the yeah. knives maybe, are being sharpened for Conte for maybe, sure. I mean, yeah. so I was gonna say, maybe maybe Christian Eriksen can start and score a goal. We've been <laughs> an hour into our podcast without mentioning him, which says no, something. It's. Um, I mean, we're going to talk about Christian Eriksen next week <laughs> because I think I don't think he's going to play against Borussia Mönchengladbach no. or or Genoa. So I think. No, but I think I think, it, I think he's he'll, he'll play against Genoa because that's the the game where you don't need the. <laughs> That's the game where you rotate. That's what I was thinking. Um, mm, yeah, probably. But we will well, talk about anyway, it next week because yeah, this is getting ridiculous. The situation with Ericsson is, is just a chapter on its own. Um, let's uh, move on to the part of the show where we pay tribute, rip the piss out of, and criticize someone or something in the world of football heavily, starting with this week's uh, Moji, which we presented by Mr. Fulvio Santucci. <laughs> So, this is another typical Italian football story, a kind of Mochi story. Uh, it, has been told to my, yeah, it has been told to my knowledge by the Italian journalist uh, Benedetto Giardina, which I want to quote, uh, specialized in Sicilian football, uh, and uh, the story is really, really embarrassing for the, for the Italian football. So, the story is located in Trapani, West Sicily, um, where the local club was able to join uh, this year's uh, Serie C, uh, for uh, the one who doesn't know is the third year of Italian football and uh, was able to join despite uh, failing uh, pay, the, pay the salary for the month uh, of uh, March and April, uh, so basically that's. Uh, how has that been possible? Um, thanks to the temporary rules of the COVID era, which uh, now allows a team to join uh, this league if they can prove to have paid the salary in the month of May. 
and they did. Uh, they did in July, thanks to the charity of the Federation, of the Football Federation, who helped the club against the COVID economic issue. Uh, so basically, Italian football authorities uh, did not have anything against the club with unpaid salaries, unpaid taxes, like 2 million euro of unpaid taxes, and players who, was, who were keen to terminate their contract uh, um, because uh, was, they were well aware of the possible situation uh, in uh, which they, they, they were in that moment. And with no chance to bring in the new players due to the tax debt, so stock mercato basically. Uh, so what happened? In mid-September, a uh, new chairman is announced, um, but uh, was never confirmed by any documents. Uh, please note that the selling chairman was involved in the huge financial issues also five years early on the, on the board of Pisa and was still able to operate uh, on, on Trapani. Uh, so coming to the, to the new chairman, no salaries paid, uh, no taxes paid. Uh, the players cannot train in the week of the first game in the league because the management was not able to organize a training compliant with the COVID sanitary rules. The coach at this point uh, has had already resigned a few days uh, earlier. They were not able to bring in a new one on time. So they just, they just did not show up uh, on the, for the first game, while the opponents, Casertana, were regularly on the pitch. And they lost 0-3 uh, for this reason. Uh, during the next week, the best player of Trapani, the striker Pettinari, third striker uh, third capo cannoniere in B, uh, in the Serie B of the, of the last year, told the press that uh, they trained without a doctor because there was no doctor and with a player positive to the COVID because there was basically nobody there to run the procedures. So that, that was really the situation in a, in a third year in a professional Italian club. Of wow. Of, of course, of course, Trapani were not able to show up for the second game. Uh, so they lost another one, 0-3, and they were excluded from the league as per regulation. Uh, so the Serie, the Serie C now goes on with 19 teams instead of the plan and 20. And during all this time, uh, roughly, roughly like 45, 50 days, nobody, I mean nobody from the Italian Football Association highlighted the case, nor took action to prevent the situation. So the Trapani now will start from the Serie D, the first non-professional tier of Italian football, uh, and the, 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 sad, the sad thing is that uh, now the Serie D is a great risk because of the new measures of Italian government against COVID, which practically forbid uh, uh, the football uh, of non-professional uh, leagues. Uh, so it's basically another story of poor and careless management, as Italian par, our, our fans are sadly getting used to it. To it. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's the module of the week. Wow. Uh... <laughs> I, I don't I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> like, wow, what what a, what a state what a sad state of affairs. Um, let's uh, move on to something hopefully much more comical. Uh, this week's uh, frog, which will be presented by Mr. William Beckner. E clamoroso autogol di Ranocchia. Yes, um, going to England for this weekend's or this week frog, I should say. It's a little bit unfair because. Uh, he wasn't really directly responsible, but I will give it to Gareth Bale um, because uh, he was uh, he was very excited to be making his uh, triumph from return to to uh, Tottenham on uh, Sunday when they played West Ham. Um, everyone was uh, focusing on him in the stands. The cameras were there. He was looking quite happy himself, and it was all going very very well indeed. Spurs were three 0 up inside 15 minutes, um, and uh, in the second half when things had quietened down. Jose Mourinho brought Gareth Bale on for his sort of uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes of um, adulation and uh, and comfort and showboating. And uh, from the moment he he came on the pitch, Spurs lost 3-0 uh, because they went from 3-0 up after 82 minutes to uh, drawing 3 all after 94. And in the middle of that, Bale also missed uh, a very important chance towards the end of uh, towards the end of the match. And uh, I, it, it was it was comical in the sense that. It looked like the most uh, comfortable uh, in reintroduction to Premier League football that you could want for a player who was maybe a little bit short of fitness. And in the end, he ended up being caught up in, I believe, um, a Premier League first. I don't think I can't recall in any league a team winning three nil after 80 minutes and not winning. Um, so his his debut was slightly ruined um, and, um, well, everyone was left looking a little bit, a little bit sick at the end. So um, I will I will give it to him because I found it comical even if even if mm, for sure um, let, let's move on to something much more 
positive this week's um, this week's uh, Moratti, which you presented by Mr. Positivity. Uh, hopefully, Mr. Mystic Mo. That remains to be seen, as he's saying Inter is going to win the Scudetto. Uh, Mr. Mohamed Nasser. He's, he works a lot. He's intelligent, and he surprises uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, quality. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. So. Uh... <laughs> Will Will really gave it to me about this. Uh, oh yeah. Flipping, uh, <laughs> uh, but it was more about it uh, about the derby being actually played, and I think it, it got played, and and all that uh, concern that we had about it being cancelled eventually just uh, dissipated in the thin air. But I won't I, I won't dwell on last week too much. This week I'm looking outside of uh, San Siro and Milano in particular to the to uh, our Moratti of the week, and it's a real toss up between um, Napoli and Crotone. Uh, both uh, teams, for different reasons, uh, have have done very commendably uh, in their particular matches. We always have to uh, commend uh, all these provincial sides, these uh, relegation uh, contenders, when they uh, take points from the big four, and uh, particularly against Juventus. So I'd like to thank them for that. But I think more importantly, it's uh, it's uh, Napoli's performance against Atalanta came out of the blue. Um, everyone had predicted that this would, would have been the match of the week and it was the match of the week but for very different reasons and it's particularly telling for me as a Moratti of the week because uh, everyone had been riding so high on Atalanta and it just goes to show uh, anything can happen in a, in a match week and um, the season really, you know, the ultimate cliche but the season is 38 match weeks long or game weeks long and the winner is the one that lasts over the entire 38 weeks and not just uh, in a microcosm of a single week or two. So I think Napoli showed us uh, that uh, no team is unbeatable. Uh, no team cannot be outscored. And uh, I, I think uh, put, I, for me at least, you know, made, made the bitter pill of uh, a derby loss a little bit uh, easier to swallow uh, this week. So they're, they're my, my particular Moratti of the week. Uh, I, I have Napoli as my number one contender for the Scudetto. And I said that because uh, I think the top four is going to be very tight, uh, tighter than it's been in a decade. Um, and I think Napoli are going to be there to the end. They're, they look complete. That's my that's my two cents on that. I think they have the most complete squad uh, out of the ones. And they don't, they don't have any question marks surrounding them the way the others do, I think. But we'll have to see. Like you said, it's 38 days long. Uh, I'd like to thank, that's all we have time for this week. I'd like to thank Mr. Kevin Hatcher. Be sure to catch him. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, you, Fulvio. Don't be a stranger. I hope so, and I try to. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be here. <laughs> always, a, always a pleasure to have you. And Mr. William Beckman. Thank you, Nima. A win and three points, please. See you next week. Six points, please. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but you know, six, three, three points in two different competitions. True, true. Uh, and Mr. Mohamed Nasser. Thank you, and six points for me as well. Thank you. Until next week, I'm your host, Nima Tawali Rutsari, wishing you all good health, six points, and sempre e solo. Forza.